Hi, y'all. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about a Just Destiny drama that happened this month with the DMCA. I'm going to talk about the DMCA and copyright law. But before all of that, just a blanket disclosure. Before you want to use, before you elect to use someone else's content on fair, you know, with a claim of fair use, think very carefully about it. Uh, and you might even want to consider consulting an attorney. Because fair use, it's important to remember, is not your right. It is an affirmative defense that you have to go into court and raise affirmatively and then prove. Uh, and it can still be defeated by the person who made the orig original claim. So it is not a right of yours. It is an affirmative defense. The burden is on you to prove that your, acti your infringing activity nevertheless should be forgiven because of the affirmative defense. An affirmative defense, the way it works is, you go into court and you say, I concede, except for damages, I concede everything that they say about me. Yes, I took that content. No, I had no right to that content. It is his copyright. I have infringed it, but I have a good reason. I have an excuse. Hear me out. And if the, if the court uh, accepts your, your explanation uh, you know, on its face, it goes back to the original complainer to say why your fair use defense should fail. And uh, they can indeed succeed on those, those uh, attempts to defeat your fair use claim. And it depends heavily on what you do with the content that you get. So be very careful. Now on the side of filing a DMCA takedown notice, you also need to be very, very careful. In both instances, you're, you're subjecting yourself to potential civil liability and criminal liability. Consult an attorney. It is not a trivial matter. It's not the internet where you just go, oh, it's on the internet, it doesn't matter. It is the beginnings of legal process. And the steps that you take from the outset, if you do not do things in a certain way, you can wind up in criminal jeopardy. And certainly uh, you have civil, civil liability. The same thing with, re with filing a counter notification. If you don't know copyright law, in and out, and other principles of law that are relevant here, you had better consult an attorney because you could be getting yourself into hot water, not just on damages, attorney sees blah, 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 but you could wind up in a prison cell uh, in the United States. And it doesn't matter where in the world you are, you're not safe from the long reach of Uncle Sam. I assure you, the United States takes this very seriously, and they do, in fact, reach out and touch people in other countries. And I'll give you, uh, just so you'll know, Americans are known the world over for, like, our flag and how attached to it we are, and our pesky little constitution. You're right, Americans are really fond of both our flag and that pesky constitution. The protection of copyright is one of the enumerated powers of Congress. It's one of, the, one of its very few explicit commands of its proper subject matter. The Cong Constitution says, hey Congress, it is your job to go out and make sure that we have laws that protect Ameri holders of American copyrights. Congress takes it very seriously, which you know, because the criminal statutes and the civil statutes, on it, criminal more particularly, impose very stiff penalties, lengthy jail pr uh, prison sentences for violations of copyright law if criminal charges are brought. And I can assure you that the United States does take it seriously. It can, it does, it has, it is right now, and I have every reason to believe it will continue to reach out to people in other countries and extradite into the United States to prosecute them for violations of American copyright law. It happens. Uh, you're playing with fire if you want to fuck around with the DMCA. And uh, <clears throat> because Congress has that explicit dictate, it has set up um, a network of laws which, if you are behaving properly, you don't have to worry about. But if you have any nefarious motive, it is meant to make you as, uh, assert certain things in particular ways that makes it very easy to prosecute and convict you. So be warned. Now, what I want to talk about here is not the instant controversy between uh, Just Destiny and LT Cobra. Uh, I'm not really interested in the, the merits of their little dispute. I'm interested in the DMCA and copyright issues. Now, it was, this whole controversy was brought to my attention because of a video I was sent by a guy named John Swan, who is an Australian, who made a video titled something like uh, Just Destiny broke the, How Just Destiny Broke the Law or Why Broke the Law, whatever, uh, an explanation of the controversy. And this John Swan guy, as I mentioned, is an Australian who is a self-styled musician and copyright expert. And like most self-styled experts, you know, the wannabe autodidacts of the world, he is absolutely incompetent. Uh, do not listen to this man for legal information anywhere. Consult an attorney. Uh, 
get legal advice, not legal information. The difference is legal advice is by a person who's licensed under law to give advice on legal matters. After looking at all of the facts of a case, legal information is, here are some things to think about, blah, blah, blah. I'm giving legal information here, not legal advice. So just FYI. Now, he uploaded a video. I'll put a link to it below. Please go watch it because it's extremely well produced. Uh, hats off to his editing and the comedy and everything, but the actual substance of the content is entirely vacuous. The man does not know what he's talking about. And LT Cobra responded by saying what a great video it is. People were like, oh, I learned so much in this. Uh, if you listen to anything that John Swan has told you and you act on that, you are setting yourself up to be a prisoner in a United States jail. Just FYI. John Swan should know, in particular, because he's an Australian, and there was recently, a couple of years ago, a big controversy in Australia about just that very issue. And uh, the guy's name is Hugh Griffiths. Um, <clears throat> he was born in the United Kingdom, moved at a young age to, the, uh, to Australia, and never left Australia since he arrived. He's never been to the United States, he's never been anywhere else so far as I know. He's only resided in Australia after he moved there. Nevertheless, he was engaging in, in Australia with other Australians. Uh, copyright, he was engaging in copyright violations. The United States government took it to a grand jury, indicted him, and then asked Australia to extradite him. The litigation, the, the back and forth over the extradition went along for three years. Uh, and my understanding is that he spent all of those three years in an Australian jail waiting for a resolution. Eventually, he was extradited to the United States. He was prosecuted, he was convicted, and, and got a very lengthy jail sentence. I think he's now returned to Australia. He got something like, I don't know, a little under five years or something like that uh, in prison. So the fact that you are in another country and have not been to the United States does not answer the question about whether or not the United States can reach out and get you. And it does not answer the question about whether or not private litigants can reach out and get you in other countries. Uh, the United States can do it, the United States has done it, the United States does do it, is currently doing it, and I have every reason to suppose will continue to do it. It is, uh, they do take copyright violations seriously. So just be warned, uh, you could be the next uh, controversy in your home country if you listen to John Swan. Uh, he, he will sing you a, a swan song right into prison. Just, okay. So <clears throat> the guy's understanding of law is completely vacuous. It, it, <clears throat> There are a number of different legal systems in the world, the United States, Australia, United Kingdom, Canada, these countries, the, the Westminster, or in the case of Australia, Washminster uh, countries, we follow the common law tradition. We're not a civil law country. Um, when I say a civil law, I don't mean we don't have civil laws. I mean, we're not a civil law code country. We're a common law country. Uh, so it's not based on Roman law. It's based on ancient UK law, uh, British law, where it's developed by judges. So what the law means is not determined by something enacted by the legislature. The legislature enacts statutes to be sure, but the interpretation and the application of that is decided by the judges. Now, uh, there are other, you could have like Islamic law countries, you could have various like uh, Soviet law countries, but anyway, uh, socialist law countries, there are other ways to do it, but we do it uh, common law style, which means that the full meaning of the law is determined in courts, not by legislatures. If the legislature doesn't like uh, the interpretation the court has given of some language. It has only one option, repeal that law and replace it with a different law that substitutes for it that uses different language. Uh, because once the courts have said this language means that, that language means that, and there's nothing that, that can be done about it except to amend the Constitution or to persuade the court that it was wrong, assuming it's the Supreme Court, uh, and it should re revisit that opinion, revisit that view. Um, or if it's a circuit court and, and it's just circuit law, revisit the, the jurisprudence. But anyway, now, there are different ways you can run court systems, the method by which disputes are resolved within any of these, country, any of these different uh, legal systems. Common law countries typically have uh, adversarial systems where the judge's job is not to be a participant in the litigation, it's to referee the litigation, to make sure there's a forum, you know, the courtroom is open, the scheduling is done, everybody knows where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to do it, make sure the attorneys aren't being dilatory and, and drawing things out, and you hold their feet to the fire to make sure that justice is done promptly and properly to make sure there are no violations of the rules, the jury's not abused, you know, all those different things, but they don't actually take, uh, they don't participate in the substance of the litigation that's happening. In uh, civil law countries and some other different uh, codes, they typically use inquisitorial justice systems, which is where the judge is not an impartial 
uh, referee. The judge is an active participant in prosecuting you. And uh, have after, at the end of the day, the, the job of the judge is not to ensure that fairness is done, but to ensure that the, the right conclusion is reached, however right conclusion is defined. So if the judge doesn't like the prosecution's case, thinks the prosecution's not bringing forth evidence that the prosecution should, the judge can introduce that, that evidence into the case and then carry on with it. And so the, at the end of the day, the judge, to, to put it in a slightly snarky way, is confronted with a question at the conclusion of the case. Did I do enough, did I do well enough in prosecuting this man to convince myself that he's guilty of the crime I was prosecuting him for? Huh. Uh, you would be surprised to learn, I'm sure not, that they virtually always agree they have done a fantastic job in presenting the case to persuade themselves that the person they think is guilty originally is in fact guilty. They almost always convict, and you almost never win on an appeal in those cases. Like, one in 10,000 cases will come back where the, uh, the trial judge's ruling will be questioned, where the observer overturned, where, oh, I'm sorry, you may have thought you did a good job prosecuting him and, and persuading yourself that you'd done a good job, but you were wrong. Happens very rarely. It's not, that's not the case in adversarial courts. So, even if the judge sees that one of the litigants is making a mistake that will irrevocably waive a legal right of, of one of the litigants, the judge will sit there and just let it happen, because they will presume that you're an adversarial party, you know your interests, you're representing your interests or your counsel, depending on if you're represented or if you're, if you're pro se, and it's your obligation to protect your, uh, to waive what you don't want to worry about and to pursue what you do want about. So they'll take it as a strategic decision on your part not to preserve that right. And once you fail to preserve that right, once that bit, once your opportunity is gone, you have lost forever the right to, to press that issue. It's just gone. So that brings me on sharply to reading the law. And the guy reads from the Copyright Act. Uh, he very ably reads the words on the page. He very incompetently interprets the words on the page. Uh, one of the, you know, the four factors you have to worry about, uh, you know, is there a, a commercial purpose for it? The substantiality, how much was used, how crucial was it to the original work from which it was taken, blah, blah, blah. Those are all factors that go into it. None of them is dispositive. But this is jumping the gun. Uh, we have case law here, going back to 1841, uh, Joseph Story, a very important member of uh, in American law, a very important commentator on American law, whose view on copyright actually is what was codified by the Congress in the Copyright Act. So the, the thrust of what uh, Joseph Story thought, they should have just written a statute that says, yeah, what Joseph Story says is the law, but they didn't. They just you know, transcribed it and, and codified it. And Joseph Story says, and the Supreme Court has accepted this reasoning, it is the law of the land that fair use presupposes good faith on the part of the person claiming it. So good faith is not very important to the resolution of the matter if the person has acted in good faith. You can act in good faith and still lose. It's still not fair use, even though you acted in complete good faith, you, you could still be liable. But if you act in bad faith, you could be fucked royally. Um, because as I mentioned, fair use depends upon your acting in good faith. If you act in bad faith, courts are not very, uh, they're not very favorable on litigants who behave in bad faith, or people who are accused of things who behaved in bad faith, and you stand a very good chance of that one act of bad faith cashing out all the other factors. And in fact, this is a Supreme Court case, so it was a, dealing with the private memoirs of a president of the United States who um, had it had been sold to a company to publish. Some newspaper got a hold of it uh, illicitly. A person who shouldn't have had access to it got it, smuggled it to them. And their bad faith in, in uh, holding on to something they know or should have known had been purloined was sufficient for them to be completely liable. They owed all the damages that the, uh, the plaintiff sought because they had acted in bad faith. And so once that bad faith thing got in there and it says, well, okay, um, you know, Harper says that uh, it presupposes good faith, fair dealing, blah, blah, blah. And Folsom against Marsh says that, um, that, fair, that good faith is not a license to infringe. Um, the courts have been wrestling with, the lower courts have been wrestling with it, and so the question arose, can other things, other forms of bad faith, other than holding on to stolen property, satisfy the bad, the bad faith thing and obviate a fair use defense? And the answer to that is yes. It is a resounding yes. It most assuredly can, including defamation. 
uh, any violation of a law. So the Copyright Act says character and purpose, character and purpose of the use. Uh, so character and purpose. What are you going to do with it when you publish it? What is it that you're doing? And how have you used it? You know, how have you gotten it? Uh, to what ends have you put it? Those are relevant considerations, and if you act in bad faith, you can, you can lose your fair use defense. So the way that fair use works, uh, it, it's important to recall, it's not a statutory right. It is an affirmative defense. So if, I, if, if you infringe someone's copyright, that is to say, if you use someone's copyright without their express consent, they have a claim. You have infringed their copyright, so they file their claim. And, uh, you know, they have to entertain certain things and make a good faith effort to, see, to contemplate fair use issues. But if, you know, if they've looked at it and said, no, I don't think this is fair use, you know, I've looked at it, blah, 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 uh, no, it doesn't strike me as fair use for whatever reason, and they bring that suit, you have an obligation to go into court and say, I wish to raise as an affirmative defense fair use. And then you have to prove that it's fair use. You have to make a case that it's fair use. The, the court may or may not accept your initial case, and if it does accept that, oh, it looks on, you know, I've listened to what you had to say, it looks good, then it goes back to the original complainer to say why it is that there's nevertheless a fact in the case that defeats your claim of fair use. And the important thing about the, the number of defenses available to you, when you uh, invoke an affirmative defense, what you are saying is everything, that they, everything the other side says about me is absolutely true. I did take it. It is his copyright. I'm conceding all that. I did not get his permission. In fact, I'm using it against his wishes, obviously. But nevertheless, I have a legal excuse where the infringement should not be penalized. That is that is what you're going into court arguing. Now, <clears throat> the way the DMCA works is it is enacted into law to, to protect service providers uh, from the bad conduct, the infringing conduct of users of its service because Congress realized uh, you could have large numbers of files, and it's just not practical to expect that the service provider is literally going to go through each one and, and then decide for some copyright holder whether or not they think that it violates their copyright. So it says safe harbor provision. But in order to get that safe harbor, the service provider has to follow uh, the law as it is set out. It has to meet each and every uh, express requirement in the law. So this John Swan um, dude, uh, when I was talking to him, he says, well, you know, look, you only have to declare under penalty of perjury if you're in the United States. If you're outside of the United States, you know, you click Australia, that block goes away, so you don't have to. That's confusing what YouTube does with what the law requires. If you look up 17 U.S.C. 512, which is the DMCA law, and look up uh, 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 C3A and B, that sets out the contents of what a notification has to contain in order to be a valid notification. And it says in subparagraph A, it has uh, six parts, Romanets 1 through 6. Romanet 6 explicitly says that the person that is true and that the information represented in the takedown notice is, is accurate, uh, and that under the penalty of perjury, they are authorized to enforce the exclusive right of the copyright holder over the allegedly infringing material. If, in, if you're in the United States, the form YouTube gives you, you will have a, a checkbox that you, you click that certifies each and every one, that complies with, with each and every one of the Romanettes. Like, uh, it has to have the signature block, um, the nature of the copyrighted material, the nature of the claimed infringement, and where to find the material. And then, uh, so there's all of that. And then subsection B, uh, sorry, th uh, um, C3B, says, it has two Romanettes, one and two. One says that, I'm sorry, let's go back up to paragraph A for a second. It says that if a person files a, a notice that substantially complies with all of the following, 1 through 6, Romanets 1 through 6, then that is a, that's legally sufficient to put the service provider on, on notice, and then the service provider has an obligation to disable access to the content or remove it. But then you get to B, and it says that if a person submits such a certification or notification that does not substantially require, uh, comply with all 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, that cannot be used as a basis to say that the service provider had actual knowledge or any reason at all to suppose there's infringing material uh, from this copyright uh, against this copyright on their service. In other words, it lets them be liable, except as provide except with the caveat of uh, Romanet two under sub of, under subparagraph 
B. And Romanet 2 says, if a person files a complaint that substantially complies with Romanet 2, Romanet 3, and Romanet 4, then YouTube, or the service provider, YouTube in this case, has, uh, it will be held liable unless it takes further action. And that further action is to contact, personally, the person who has filed the substantially compliant with uh, 2, 3, and 4 notice to get the assurances, to get a, a legally sufficient assurance on that part which is left out, 1, 5, and 6. So when you change the box from the United States to Australia or any other country that's not in the United States, the I declare under the penalty of perjury bit goes away. And the reason for that is because of 28 U.S. Code 1746, which deals with how uh, unsworn statements under the penalty of perjury are done within the United States versus without the United States. Within the United States is just an assertion that I declare under the pains and penalty of perjury, blah, blah, blah. The foregoing is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge. But if the declaration is, uh, is sworn to, it, the unsworn declaration is affirmed, certified, ratified, assented to, asserted, whatever, claimed outside of the United States, you have to add in an extra provision which says that I declare that it is true and correct, blah, 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 under the laws, under, under perjury, under the laws of the United States. And that's the difference. So this is a, YouTube has disabled those two parts, those such, uh, that part for a reason. Either it wants to be held liable uh, and it has no intent to follow up on these things for claims that come from without the United States, which would, I guess, be a plausible explanation if the copyright experts it employed were of the same caliber as John Swan, the, the self-appointed and self-proclaimed copyright expert. Uh, so that's one option. The other option is that they actually employ lawyers who are actually trained in copyright law and who are experts in copyright law, and this is a way to protect people from malicious uh, takedown notices from overseas. By taking that out, meaning that they have to follow up, that means that the person has to disclose a, a real way to get a hold of them, an actual phone number, an actual address to contact them. YouTube will then contact them and tell them where to send their certification uh, uh, with the pains and penalty of perjury bit, uh, uh, you know, what it has to say, and substantially what it has to say, and where it needs to be sent. So that way it is, they know that the person who has filed it isn't malicious in the sense that it's not just an anonymous troll. It is a person who can be contacted by the person against whom the claim has been made. So that way that person, if they wish, can perfect their own rights in retaliation for um, the abuse if it, is an, if, it, if it is a malicious takedown. And then you get to the second part, the counter notification. If you want to know what that is, that you go down to G3D. Well, actually, you go down a whole bunch of things. But relevant here is that in the counter notification, you declare under the, penalty, the you know, pains and penalty of perjury that thus and such is true. But in addition to that, subsection uh, D there, uh, G3D, says that, uh, and you have to have a blurb that substantially says the following. I submit to the jurisdiction of the United States District Court in the federal district where the headquarters of YouTube, where the service provider, is located, which happens to be California. Now, Justin, uh, Just Destiny, whatever his name is, is in New York, uh, but because the person is overseas, if any litigation is going to happen, it has to first start in California, because that's the jurisdiction the person is agreeing, uh, that he, he agrees to not only the jurisdiction, but it's the venue to which he's agreed. You can get the, the venue moved by consent of the parties, but the first bite uh, happens there. That's where the legal process happens. Now, in both cases, the law is designed so the way the person who is overseas is, one way or another, submitting uh, themselves to the jurisdiction of the United States court. By being the filer outside of the United States, uh, you get something in response that says, I, uh, I'm challenging you, I will accept service in where my address is, uh, but if the person who does the counter notification is out of the United States, they're saying, I will accept service, not where I live, but I will accept service in the district court in the United States where the service provider is located. Now, there are a number of criminal statutes that can be brought to bear after this has happened, one of which is obviously the perjury thing, the 1746 I mentioned. Uh, so any material misrepresentations in there, uh, you, the United States government can, and sometimes does, reach out and touch you. There's also Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which allows for the judge to just sanction you in the court, uh, and whether or not the person decides to pursue criminal charges is up to the United States, and the person, whether or not they want to bring it to the attention of the United States Attorney, 
or whether or not the judge wants to refer it to the United States Attorney, which they sometimes do if it's particularly egregious. But there are other things that go into it, too. One of which is that California, these are the uh, three sisters of, of antiquity, the unholy alliance of three arcane uh, concepts of law, the, the law of baratry, maintenance, and champerty. Um, relevant here is baratry, which is that you can have a valid claim against someone, which if you pursued for one purpose, would be a lawful, a proper lawsuit to file and maintain. But if done for another purpose, is actually a crime. Uh, if you do it because you don't, because it, vexatious litigation, because you want to harass the person, or you want to, you know, it, it's, you, if your purpose is to harass them, or to engage in vexatious litigation, even if you have a non-frivolous claim, you have an actual claim that, if properly pursued, could be maintained. You have nevertheless committed a crime by pursuing it for a corrupt or improper purpose. So that would be on the part of just destiny. If he decided, if this LT Cobra guy filed a counter notification, just destiny, if he files in court in California for an improper motive, could be held liable under California state law, if it were a state court, uh, for a violation of California Penal Code, I think Section 158. But this would be in federal court. So then the question is, can what would be unlawful under state law be a crime if committed in federal court within the state of California? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. There's 18 United States Code, Section 13, which is the casually called the Assimilative Crimes Act, which means that if Congress has not enacted a statute that makes some particular conduct unlawful, but that conduct nevertheless happens on federal property. And there is a state law that criminalizes that conduct. That state law is incorporated into federal law. So suppose there's not a crime. There, there is. You can't commit murder on federal property, but suppose there's no murder crime. Uh, and you walk into a courthouse and murder someone in the courthouse, the federal courthouse, or a military base, or any federal conclave, and there's no federal statute against murdering people. Well. 18 U.S. 18 U.S. Code uh, 13 picks up the state law crimes of homicide, and they become federal law in that district. So you can be pursued in federal court under 18 U.S. Code 13 for the violation of the penal law of that state. It is incorporated into federal law. So even though there's no baritary statute at the federal level, there is in the state of California, which can be uh, successfully prosecuted in federal court as federal law. So you had better make sure, if you're going to do this, that you're going there with a, uh, a proper purpose and not an improper purpose because the improper purpose can get you uh, 10 to 15. <laughs> I don't actually know how long it is. Uh, but that's in addition to perjury uh, and that's in addition to any sanctions that the court can impose on you for filing vexatious or frivolous litigation. Now, so that's just the statutory framework and, and the criminal liability that attaches or to which you could be potentially subject if you behave with bad faith. What is the process by which a case would go in? Um, well, in international law, you have this guy doesn't understand the distinction between choice of forum and choice of law. I may have not mentioned this already, but there's a case. It's called London Films, and it was a UK firm filing suit against a defendant in the United States for in the United States court for copyright violations that happened in Chile and other countries in Latin America. And so the question there is. Where is the proper forum for this lawsuit, for this litigation to take place? You would think that, uh, is, as is normally the case, it happens to be that litigation is pursued in the country where the infringement took place. That's just a custom. It's not a rule. It's not a requirement. That's just the way it happens to work out most of the time. So in this case, the London case was, was prosecuted. Uh, the litigation was handled in the United States court but not applying United States law, it was applying Chilean law and the law of cert, uh, certain other Latin America countries uh, against the defendant, and successfully so. So you, you've got jurisdiction, venue, and then choice of law in these issues. Jurisdiction is which country's courts have the power to hear it. Venue is which particular court in the country is the right place for the trial to happen. And then choice of law is whose uh, country's law applies. What, law, what legal codes will the judge in that case, be applying. And so you have that kind of issue going on. So John Swan's argument is that LT Cobra, because he's in the United Kingdom, just, uh, just Destiny would have to go to the United Kingdom and sue him there. Absolutely false. He can sue him uh, from the United States quite comfortably. And now we get into 
how you can be right on the merits and still lose your case because of your own failures or your own conduct. So assume for a moment that Just Destiny has a bad faith uh, filing. He doesn't think that there's a copyright violation going on. He's doing it to be malicious. He's engaging in barratry. He wants vexatious litigation. He can still prevail. And the reason for it is, is that, well, we have these things called rules of civil procedure. So Rule 8 sets out some of the requirements that have to be met in order to file a suit, which are very obvious and easy. You know, the Common sense will tell you these are things that have to go in there, but nevertheless, you have to have rules that say it has to go in there. Uh, so for some of the uh, not obvious things, there are other rules, like Rule 10 will tell you each of your paragraphs has to have a number beside it. So that's a technical detail that has to be there, but it doesn't affect the substance of the case. It's just the administrative handling of it. And if, you, if it's administratively defective, they'll send it back to you and say, you've got to number your paragraphs, that kind of thing. But Rule 8 says, you know, you've got to make a, sta a jurisdictional statement. Uh, United States court, you have jurisdiction because of, in this case, the Copyright Act, uh, United States copyright law. And then a short and plain statement about the cause of action uh, that on or about, or, you know, on March 3rd or whatever it was, so-and-so uh, uploaded a video which contained uh, this clip and that clip or the other clip, whatever it is, which uh, I have the exclu exclusive copyright to without my permission. That is infringement of my copyright, blah, blah, blah. And so it's very simple, straightforward kinds of things. And for each of your particular claims, you know, like Rule 10 says you've got to number it. Uh, but in Rule 8, you know, just one, so claim one for one clip. Second claim for the use of a second clip. Claim three for the use of a third clip, and so on. However, however many claims there are in that one action. But then something else happens. Service of process. I should stop right here, though. Um, each court also has local rules for how this works out, and they have to deal with a number of factors for pro se litigants. Like some, for if you're a pro se litigant who can't afford the filing fee, you can file. Uh, you can petition the court to be. Uh, to go in and form a pauperous, which in the form of a pauper, which means that your fees are waived, but uh, that you know it goes to the clerk like normal. But the clerk will you fill out the application, give it to the clerk, and then before anything happens, the clerk sends it to a judge, who will review the case and the application, and then make a decision whether or not you qualify for inform for IFP status, and uh, if you do, whether or not your litigation, your claim, states a claim, whether or not it's frivolous or malicious. So they'll do a quick review of whether or not it actually states something that is a tribal issue and it's not frivolous. And then they'll let you know uh, later on that your case has been accepted, blah, blah. And then it goes on like it does usually, except that the courts are the ones who do the serve the process, not you. If it's just you, you go to the clerk, fill out everything, give them the paperwork, uh, and you know they you get, they sign all the summons and everything, blah blah blah. You, under, under the local rules, uh, you get all that back, and then you're responsible for going and serving it. And then you and anyway, it goes to the judge eventually after after some responses come in. And this is what's important here. Under Rule Eight, it says you know that for each claim that is made, a party who has been sued, the the respondent or the defendant has to claim by claim, unless you're going to generally deny everything, claim by claim, either affirm uh, or deny that it's true. So, no, I did not do this. Yes, I did do that. No, I didn't do the other. And there's some exceptions, but if, it, if the claim requires a response, you have to deny it. And if you don't deny it, you have conceded that it's true. So, this is, to, this is how default judgments get in in a lot of cases. The people, oh, I'm, I got served. I'm just going to ignore it and it'll go away. It won't go away. Your non-response is a concession that the claims are true and then it'll move on after a period of time to a default judgment. But there's the international law, actually law gets complicated, that's why you need lawyers. There's a minor involved here. Can you sue a minor? Well, yes. Yes, as it turns out, you can. So now we go to rule nine where it says right at the, you know, part, you know, right at the top that the capacity of a person to sue or be sued need not be asserted. So it's irrelevant whether or not the person is able, whether or not the person is a minor or an incompetent person. It, their legal existence also doesn't matter. Anyway, and so then you go on, you read through the rule, and it says, you know, okay, what to do with respect to a minor who has a representative, what to do with respect to a minor who doesn't have a representative, and a whole bunch of other things in between, you know, who can sue in their own name for the benefit of someone else, you know, an executor, someone with a fiduciary relationship, trustees, blah, 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 blah. A whole bunch of stuff goes into it. But the point of it is, is that the, the first, it also talks about guardians. For a minor, 
Uh, you would also it would go through your know, next friend or the guardian, the natural guardian in this case, the parent. But what happens if the parent says, oh, I'm going to ignore it and let it go and it'll just go away? It's not against me. You're wrong. Uh, if you refuse to show up, it says you may show, you may uh, make uh, an appearance, but you need not. And if you refuse to do it, then the court will simply issue such an order to appoint a guardian ad litem who will represent your child's interests, which you may be financially liable for once the, the default judgment comes by. So that so we have Rule 8, Rule 9, I just talked about Rule 17, and then the default judgment is Rule 55, and it talks about uh, the clerk in most, in most of these cases can just go ahead and enter a default judgment if there's no response, except for with respect to minors, the courts have to do it, and they can't do it without having a representative of the minor present. It doesn't mean a legal representative, it just means someone who's representing, you know, uh, someone who's competent to speak for a minor, a parent, or if the parents refuse, uh, he can appoint by appropriate order a guardian ad litem who will be a stranger to your child, who will nevertheless be there to like make the best case they can with a non-cooperative defense, you know, uh, a group of people who are not cooperating in the, in the litigation. And uh, all I can tell you is that unless it is uh, blindingly obvious from the four corners of the document, there's nothing there, which in case it could have been thrown out very easily, uh, you, you stand a very good chance of <clears throat> a default judgment being entered against your child for which you may well be liable. So it's not an option to just ignore the, the process. Now, in the, uh, the notice, counter notice, DMCA things, as I mentioned, there is at every step of the way something that is slipped in that is a requirement to be met, which makes the person subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Now, John Swan says, oh, you don't have to agree with the law of the United States. I completely agree. You do not have to agree that the law of the United States is good law. You don't have to agree that you like the law. You don't have to agree that the law is good. You don't have to agree that the law is the one that should apply. But you must agree to accept the jurisdiction of the United States for whatever law it applies. And so that is what is there. It is to protect the service providers by making them make sure that if there's going to be a litigation between two parties, that they as the third person, the intermediary there, the place where the material is stored, that each party must disclose and consent to a forum, a jurisdiction, and have ways to serve process on each other. That is, they have to, the law requires them to collect such information and verify such information to make sure that each of the disputing parties, if they wish to litigate it, have an effective way to litigate it. Uh, and then it's completely out of the hands of the service provider. And they do that in a lot of different ways, and it should not be surprising that all of them are designed uh, to protect American copyright, because after all, that is an explicit dictate given by the Constitution to the Congress, and we do love our Constitution here. So, um, can uh, d defamatory uses obviate fair use? Yes. Uh, can false light uh, uses uh, obviate fair use. Yes, they can. Now, it, it's easy to make the claim that, oh, it's defamatory or, oh, it's false light or blah, blah, blah. Uh, proving it's a different matter. But the, the point of the law isn't whether or not, in any particular case, you will or will not be successful on the merits of the argument. It's whether or not it is a viable uh, litigation strategy, a litigation goal. And, and it is. And so, on the Baratree point, I mentioned with an improper purpose for the filing of the lawsuit, um, I don't know what Justin, uh, Just Destiny knows. I don't know how savvy he is in the law, given some of the things I've heard him say. Uh, he strikes me as a bit of a dilettante on, on a great number of matters, but I haven't paid much attention to him. Maybe he's really bright and he knows what he's doing, and he thought very carefully, and he said, well, you know, the bad faith requirements, uh, defamation is bad faith, uh, it's not permissible under the law, something that's not permissible under the law uh, can't serve as a good faith basis to do this, and therefore, I'm bringing it, you know, on that basis, as opposed to I just want the guy to shut up and go away because I don't like him and he's pissed me off. I don't know which I don't know what was in his head. But what I do know is that that is an issue of fact to be disputed to a jury, not uh, to be decided by, uh, you know, assholes on the internet. So if, if he wishes to pursue it, I know he's dropped the he's retracted the claim. So you have that going on, but the uh, the the idea that you can just use someone else's work for any purpose, whatever, as long as you only use little bits here, or you go out of your way to make sure it's not commercial or something, then that, I mean, it's not true. You have to act with proper motives and proper means throughout. 
So uh, don't delude yourselves into thinking that you are thereby immunized. If, well, if I only use this 10 seconds out of an hour long, because it's only 10 seconds, I can use it for whatever I want and I'm, I'm off scot-free. That is simply uh, not the case. Now, on the defamation point, the particular claims in, the, in one of the claims in John Swan's video is that uh, Just Destiny is uploading content that depicts the sexual exploitation of minors. You need to be very careful there, sir. Um, in defamation law, there are two types, two categories of defamation. I don't mean slander and libel. I mean two categories of defamation. You know, defamation per quad and defamation per se. Most of defamation cases are defamation per quad, where it's not enough to assert that a person said a thing or wrote a thing. You have to, in addition, go into court and show that you have been injured in some material way by the saying of that. That's the normal kind of defamation. You know, oh, he's, a, he's an asshole or whatever it is. That's the normal kind of defamation case. Defamation per se, as I uh, tried to explain to Sister Danger without any success, is a different category of defamation. The uh, person who is, is uh, filing the suit for defamation per se has to prove one and only one thing that you said, that you made the statement or you wrote the statement, you know, whether it's libel per se or slander per se. That's it. And your only defense to that is that it is true. So unless you can go into court and say, this is true, and here's the proof that this is true, you have lost. The, the person claiming it has to prove nothing else because the damage, the reputational harm, the damages are presumed. That means that uh, the bare fact they prove that you said it and you can't prove that it's true means you're on the hook for damages. Uh, it could be statutory damages. Uh, it, it, all, it, it depends on uh, how, how well off everybody is, but you are on the hook for damages. And there are four categories of statements that are defamation per se. They're very narrow. There are only four types of statements you can make that qualify, but once you make them, unless you can prove it to be so in court, you have, uh, left, your, you have left everything that you own liable to uh, someone else. You, you're essentially... When you want to make these, I'll talk about them in a second, when you want to make one of these four types of claims about someone, you might as well just take out everything you own and look at it and say, it's well worth getting rid of you because once I make this statement, absent proof that it's true, this person, if they sue me, can take all of it. One of which is um, an accusation of unchaste or conduct or sexual impropriety of whatever type. The claim that a person has sexually uh, has is showing on his channel material uh, that depicts sexually explicit has sexually sexually explicit depictions of minors is a claim of sexual impropriety that the person is uh, disseminating distributing child pornography and you have no claim that you think that it's even reasonably the case that it is so and the way that I know that you don't believe that it is so is precisely because you took some of that imagery and put it in your video. And if you thought that material depicted children engaging in sexually explicit conduct, then you would have to further conclude that it is a crime, because it is a crime in your country, my country, and the UK, and that uh, you are then taking it, so you are receiving child pornography, and then you yourself are distributing child pornography. So you have only two, op two sets of options here. You have to concede that you have peddled child pornography, you have distributed child pornography, or that the material is not child pornography. Child pornography being defined as uh, videographic material that has graphic representations of children engaged in sexually explicit conduct. So unless you're going to say, that's child porn, and I uploaded child porn, I'm guilty of you know, disseminating child porn, you're going to lose on the defamation case. Because you don't have any, you, you, you don't think that it is so. Or the other way to go about it is to say, uh, you know, it, it, I'm, I may have gotten confused there. I hope I didn't misstate it. Uh, you, you have one of two options. You can say that I, uh, I do believe that this is child pornography, and then you're thereby conceding that you have disseminated child pornography. Or you say, I don't believe that this is the thing that I said that it is, in which case you're admitting that you don't have any proof that the claim that you've made about just destiny is so. Uh, other types would be uh, engaging in uh, illicit trade practices for a business. Uh, another would be um, engaging in criminal conduct or having a contagious and infectious and much maligned disease like, uh, I don't know, uh, cholera or 
dysentery or I, I don't know uh, AIDS. Falsely saying that someone has AIDS when they don't uh, can, is defamation per se. So the bare fact that you made the assertion that he did violate a law is defamation per, can be defamation per se depending on what evidence you have. Uh, the fact that you're accusing him, depending on what evidence you have, of some kind of sexual impropriety, uh, in this case, uh, distributing child pornography, uh, leaves you liable to defamation per se suits, uh, depending on the evidence that you have. I don't think you have evidence of any kind whatever that anything improper has happened, that any sexually explicit material uh, that depicting, you know, depic that any material depicting sexual activity between minors is on his channel. You have no evidence whatever of that. Uh, if you did, you would call the police, you wouldn't download it, look at it, and then you know, re-upload it on the internet. Neither you nor LT Cobra would do that. And LT Cobra, who's... Bleh, did make one thing, uh, one comment about being underage, and how you're of age, so for you it's a crime, for me not so much, or words to that effect. That's not true. Uh, in the United States, we have, I think, a quarter million minors on uh, sex offender registry lists. Some as young uh, as nine years old for conduct they engaged in as minors, some of which includes uh, sexual activity themselves, some of which includes dissemination, distribution, or uh, solicitation, or pro promoting child pornography. Uh, they, they do go to juvenile court, there is a finding, and they can, in fact, be put on child sex offender, I'm sorry, on sex offender, sex offender registry lists for life for that conduct that they committed as a minor, in addition to whatever uh, punitive sentences they get. So, do not believe that because you have not reached the magical age of 18 that the law is powerless against you. It is far from the case. Uh, and do not believe that because you live in another country, the long arm of Uncle Sam can't reach out and get you, because it is far from the case. Um, there are matters that are important to the federal government, which they will flex their muscle against the little guy to make a point, one of which is violations of copyright laws, Another issue on which they're very, uh, unlike in the UK, I can understand why if you live in the UK you might think this isn't a big deal because they've been ignoring rape gangs there for years. Oh, whatever, they're just rapists, let them go. Oh, you know, boys will be boys, let them have their fun, the kids will grow out of it. Uh, we don't have that same view in the United States. Uh, the rape of children we take very seriously here. Um, and the dissemination, distribution, receipt, uh, solicitation, anything you can think child pornography related that deals with... Uh, possessing it, giving it to someone, getting it from someone, uh, telling someone that you have it and you want to sell it to, anything like that, we take it very seriously. The federal government takes it very seriously. And we do, in fact, reach out across the great divide of the seas of the world and snatch people up. We do extradite. And uh, we do file for extradition, I should say. And other countries do, in fact, extradite to us when we do it. Uh, we... <sighs> I guess I can't really speak as to our success on extradition, extradition requests because I don't actually know. But I do know that we file them uh, routinely and they are routinely honored. And you can sit in a prison in your own country for years uh, while you're resisting it, depending on um, your, your own country. And I will also point out that in the United States, this is not related to international law, it's just what's called the dual, sovereign, dual sovereignty doctrine which is that everywhere you go in the United States, so if you're on state property and it's something owned by the state, uh, you're still in the United States, and you are subject to two separate sovereigns who have two separate laws, independent sources of law, and an independent right to prosecute you for the same conduct, uh, for the same actions. And if you, uh, the federal government will often not choose to prosecute people who have been uh, dealt with in another legal system, simply as a matter of comedy to respect the judicial processes of the states and of uh, foreign countries, so long as the federal government is convinced that the prosecutors in the court system were in good faith trying to, to take the matter to a fair conclusion, even if the conclusion winds up being that the jury finds the person not guilty, the, the person is acquitted or something. The federal government will almost always say, that's good enough for us, our interest has been vindicated by that one trial, but sometimes not. Sometimes, under, they're called the Petit Principles, P-E-T-I-T-E, -E, um, the federal government will say, no, I'm sorry, state, or I'm sorry, other country. We don't like the way you did things. We think you were softballing it. We think that you were just trying to do as little as possible. You really weren't taking it seriously. Our interests have not been vindicated. And therefore, after you're finished with your trial and whatnot, we are also going to prosecute this person. We are going to file charges 
and we're going to indict this person and we're going to prosecute them independently. Uh, and a good example of that was the Rodney King beating. He was a, the four uh, cops who beat him were acquitted in state court, and the federal government said, no, this is one of those cases where the federal interest has not been served by this adjudication. The United States interest in seeing that its laws be enforced, its civil rights legislation be enforced, has not been vindicated by this, this uh, miscarriage of justice. And so after the people were acquitted for beating Rodney King at the state level, they were in indicted and successfully prosecuted at the federal level for the same conduct, even though they'd already been previously acquitted. It's called the Dual Sovereignty Doctrine, and it, it rests on comity. It's just on friendly relations between other actors in, in a legal system, uh, and that unless there's some reason to think something extraordinary is going on, as a general matter, if it's being handled even not in the best possible way by another sovereign who has the right to enforce it, respect their decisions. But if they behave badly, or it's a gross miscarriage of justice, a different decision. And that does, in fact, happen. Uh, if other countries will prosecute the person, uh, we'll let it go, even if it ends in an acquittal, uh, for, you know, it, oftentimes. But there are occasions, about 200, 300 times per year in the United States, where the federal government says, you know, that prosecution uh, just does not really vindicate the United States' interest in this topic. Uh, so, uh, no disrespect to you other courts, uh, other jurisdictions, other sovereigns, but we're nevertheless going to pursue charges and do it on our own to make sure that our interest is vindicated. Um, so, whether we get you, whether the United States gets you by referring you to the courts in your own country for prosecution under the laws of your own country, and then your country you know, fulfills that in some way, or makes a reasonable prosecutorial decision not to, uh, that satisfies the United States, we'll let it go. But if they don't, we won't. And you may well find yourself being extradited to the United States, where I assure you, our penalties for uh, even minor violations of copyright law and other, and other laws that other countries don't take as seriously are taken very seriously here, and they can lead to very lengthy jail sentences, very lengthy periods of imprisonment, and very hefty fines, because the United States does actually take it seriously. So you fuck with the DMCA, thinking that it's, oh, it's an internet joke, I'm a minor, I'm in the UK, it won't matter. You're, you're wrong. Uh, you are dead wrong. All right, have a good day.